Hi readers, it is Admin Kate with you today. Um, I am filling in for Admin Lauren. Um, I know she wishes she could be here to do the Halloween chat, um, but I also love Halloween and so I'm very excited to be having this like perfect spooky season read. Um, so I get weird being, oh my gosh, too excited, jumping over my words. We will be discussing uh, The Enemy at Home today by Kevin O'Brien. Um, he'll be joining us shortly to discuss all things historical fiction, suspense, and of course, Halloween. Um, and make sure you leave your questions for us in the chat. Um, a fellow admin of mine will be in there checking in on you guys and chatting with you all. Um, yeah, so let us get started. I'm going to bring Kevin on screen. Welcome, Kevin. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Pretty it's good. Nice no here. complaints. It's chilly here out in the New York City area and perfect Halloween weather. Yes. I love it. I got memories of when I was a kid going out and trick-or-treating and it was just that I lived in Chicago. So. Oh, so very cold. <laughs> it would be really, you didn't want to go as, you know, as a, as Adam or something like that. You, yeah. you wanted you to be having long pants on. Yeah. Um, like I said, we'll be discussing your book, which I'm very excited to do. Um, for any new readers, can you give us a quick synopsis of it? Sure. The book is The Enemy at Home by me, Kevin O'Brien. <laughs> and it is about, I, in a sentence or two, the elevator pitch is um, Rosie the Riveter meets Jack the Ripper. And um, my heroine is Nora Kinney, and she's a mother of two, two teenagers. And she, her husband is a doctor who's away at, in um, North Africa in the Army Medical Corps during World War II. And um, she decides to become a riveter and uh, finds that it's not an easy, easy job. And um, a lot of resistance from some of the men at the factory, at the Boeing plant where she's a riveter. And um, one of her friends that she's just met is murdered. And she becomes sort of an amateur sleuth and uh, tries to solve the murder. Uh, all the, all this while, her son is acting very strangely, and so she's there's a thing in the back of her head that she's a little she's she's kind of worried that he could be the killer, and she's trying mm -hmm. to convince herself that he isn't. So. Yeah, that's like yes, that very, an idea. Very, yeah, it's a great pitch. I like yeah, definitely the Rosie Riveter, Jack the Ripper, which. Very creepy, very creepy story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if I can get creepy, then I, I'm happy. <laughs> yes. It's always, no. it's always a mixed feeling because I, I write at night and sometimes um, I'll get the, it bings on my computer here and it it's like an email message. So I check it out and it's some reader in Minnesota, you know, at three o'clock in the morning saying, well, I hope you're happy. I can't get to sleep now because I'm scared. <laughs> I've checked the windows. I've checked the doors and 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 I'm like, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you like, know? I'm very like, yes, good. It works. Oh no, <laughs> yeah. No, that's me when I read. I'm like, I don't know, creepy books. I'm not. It's creepy movies that always get me. But books also, once your imagination gets going at that like, like midnight to one o'clock, and you're like, you know, maybe I should sleep now, and then you can't. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, later in the as it gets even closer to dawn. Uh, you get very susceptible to any kind mm -hmm. of suggestion and you can, your emotions are a little weird. I was talking to some psychiatrist who told me that like very late at night or early, early in the morning before going to bed, you can be extremely emotional and extreme, you know, it's not a good time to discuss, have an argument with a spouse or anything else because it, you're, you're just a little too fragile, vulnerable and I'm going to, to go to weird places. I could see that where you're because you're not fully awake. Or yeah. asleep. It's like a weird in between. I that makes sense. Like when you say yeah. that, I'm like, now that I think about it, like anytime I wake up at like three or four o'clock for some reason, it's always like, I don't believe in ghosts, but maybe there's someone like maybe I, heard something. <laughs> I heard something one day and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go back to sleep and pretend I didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah that's the best way. <laughs> well, I am so glad you're here. Thank with you. us today to discuss your book. I know we've had a lot of fun discussing it in the group. Um, so I think we may have some reader questions coming in. I see so, some on the side of my yeah, computer. They're, just they're ready to go. Up. Thank you, people. 
Um, so I will start with one of those before I jump into some of the questions that we have. Um, okay. Uh, I, this is a very good question. I don't think we've had this one before. Did you learn anything about yourself after writing the book or maybe through writing the book? You know, that's a, that is a terrific question. I think, I think, um, you know, most of my thrillers have been contemporary thrillers up until mm -hmm. now. And, um, so one of the, one of the things that influenced me to write this book was I, I'd had it in my head, like, I got the idea 10 years ago, at least. Okay. And I threw it to my editor and said, what do you think about the idea of somebody's out there murdering Rosie the Riveters during World War II as you know, like a serial killer before the term serial killer was even invented? That didn't, mm -hmm. didn't come around till 1970s. And I, um, I kind of liked the idea. I was really passionate about it. But my editor was like, you know, don't rock the boat. People are expecting contemporary thrillers from you and they're going to be disappointed. And in fact, I read a couple of reviews from people who were like, this isn't like his other books, but it, it was, I think it, what happened was um, the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and I also turned retirement age. I was 65 and I was like, you know, I want to do something different. I want to shake things up. And um, so that's one of the things I learned about myself. I was like, I wanted to kind of, I didn't want to just kind of keep putting out the same books over and over. I wanted to kind of shake it up. And I really, really enjoyed doing the research. That's another thing I found out about myself. I, would I, say, I always love a research discussion. <laughs> I, I know. And usually, you know, for contemporary, you do a lot of research anyway, because it's like, for example, I had um, one of my heroes was an occupational therapist. And so I had to look up what that entailed, you know, what kind mm -hmm. of degree would they have? And then that that affects the whole background of the person. You know, how many, you know, how many kids were in his family? How many would, where did he grow up? What were his parents like? All that stuff. Um, so, but when you put something in a specific time and place, like World War II Seattle, you suddenly, it, the research is vast. It's like, and, and you have to, hesitate before you do anything it's like mm -hmm. well i can't do that i you know did that phrase was that even you know you can't use i trying to think of some of the phrases that we have that are modern just anything that smacks of uh well just as an example you know uh there's a line in titanic where mm -hmm. leonardo dicaprio says well you're sort of an out outdoors girl aren't you and i'm like that doesn't smack of 1919, uh, 1940. Yeah. It sounds too much like contemporary. So every time, you know, I would have even just a line of dialogue, it, I'd have to stop and and kind of re-examine it. But that was, that was the fun part. I love doing the research. I, I had one thrill, one of my thrillers flashback to the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. Mm -hmm. I loved doing the research for that. I just you know, that Elvis was there and filming a movie and the Beatles came and John F. Kennedy was there. And I just love that sort of stuff. So that was that was one of the things I found out about myself. I love doing research. But say, I always I am always fascinated by how much, especially with like historical fiction or anything set, you know, prior to contemporary times is always like there's so much. And I and you um there was like a phrase I remember, I think. Nora said in the book, and I remember reading it and going, that sounds right. But I was like, oh, 1940s. This is very different than how. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm the youngest of six kids and my parents, mm -hmm. you know, were adults and already had a family started when the war was going on. So mm -hmm. I got all sorts of phrases that are from the war and stuff that they were still using back in the late 60s when I was growing up. So it's like... Yeah it's yeah it's it's very funny it's like yeah <laughs> no that makes me think sorry and then I've, i'll switch conversations but i um for the longest time kept saying oh i'm gonna watch a show i'm gonna watch a show and i meant movies in my head not tv shows and i realized one day from my mom and my stepmom they both referred to movies as shows and i was like that's where that's from i was like why do i keep calling movies shows or i'm like yeah i'm gonna watch this show yeah. i'm gonna go see the show and I finally heard my mom say it and I was like, it's you, you are where I heard that from. Cause I was like, no one else I know refers to movies as shows. Yeah. Like, my mom still called, you know, I had a stereo, you know, 
uh, like no kid in the 60s didn't. She still called it a Victrola. <laughs> I'm like, I can I'm see. Like, that's that's going back to the 40s, isn't it? Or like <laughs> even the 30s. So, but you know, I mean, I, I find myself doing that. It's try getting over 60, then you're like, oh my God, I'm my parents. I'm turned into my parents. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I'm already turning it to my mom. <laughs> no, it's a good thing, though. But um, all right, so I'll swap over to our questions. So we've got a few of those. One more um, thing about research is the great oh, thing yeah. about research is you can procrastinate on writing. <laughs> You're like, yeah, wait yeah, a minute, I, have, I need yeah, to yeah. research that. I don't have to. I, and then you can still feel like you did some work. You know, it's like. It's productive. It's still productive. I, I think yeah, that. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I interrupted just, you. But I was. Like, oh, no, no. You're good. There was something good. lingering back there. I was like. What's the other great thing about research? The fact that you can be looking at things and, you know, you can, I can be looking at a whole documentary on World War II and be like, this is research. I'm actually, I'm being productive. <laughs> I know that feeling. That's how I feel when I look at TikToks. <laughs> <laughs> this is research. This is research. I into a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, I think you kind of touched on this in when you were kind of you were saying in a flashback you were looking into Seattle World War II or with um like Elvis and the Beatles. Yes, so I was curious, people. um, what was the inspiration for? Or can you speak to a little bit more about the inspiration for setting it in Seattle? Well, Seattle, you know, one is you know it's one of the first writing lessons you get is to you know write set it in your own backyard it's the it's the easiest way you know to to get started and mm -hmm. just describe things so much easier and i was very lucky i had a um i had a railroad job before i was a writer before i actually was writing full time and before i was published um and i traveled all through the pacific northwest for like God, well, I, I had the railroad job for 17 years. In fact, published two of my first, uh, my first book was published in 1986. And the next one was 1995. And I had the railroad job through that time. And um, in fact, when I published my first book, I, I was all ready to, you know, I was ready to be a famous author and do that full time and give up, you know, give up the railroads. And I met Terry Brooks, the wonderful fantasy author. And he said, Kevin, don't quit your railroad job until you have enough to live on for about two years. And I was like, okay, well, so, and I'm glad <laughs> I listened to him. But um, I, through my travels, I, you know, got to know so much of the Pacific Northwest. And so as a writer, I could set things like in Tacoma or, you know, Portland or, you know, Montana or someplace where I'd, been, mm -hmm. I'd done my traveling. So Seattle was like the naturally the first city I thought of. And it turned out to be one of the biggest cities, um, like one of the biggest defense industry towns during the war um, on the map. And it sort of put Seattle on the map. It was sort of a sleepy little town. And suddenly we had Boeing, we had the shipyards, we had... Mm -hmm. Um, we had several um, military bases in and around Seattle. And so um, it just, it turned into a big, it was a big um, war industry town. And on top of that, um, so much stuff was going on too, just in Seattle. We had blackouts. We were the, mm -hmm. one of the first cities to actually have um, like, strict blackout re regulations um starting at 11 o'clock all the lights had to go out you had to pull your shades your outside porch lights had to go out your the if you drove you had to put blue um cellophane over your headlights so that it couldn't be seen from the air and this was all to prevent uh to to sort of black out the city to keep um japanese um the japanese from bombing us and so um it worked in it worked for England, and so they were trying trying it out in the United States, and they kept those regulations through the war. Um, so they were blackouts every night in Seattle. They were also um, one of the saddest things of the this West Coast was um, the internment of Japanese Americans. They mm -hmm. they were um, taken out of their homes and uh, made to live in these like camps 
almost not quite concentration camps, but they were like internment camps in, you know, the worst areas, like most the worst weather, like in the middle of Montana or in the middle of uh, Idaho or something like that, um, where there was just like either desert or just terrible cold. Um, and um, it was it was pretty tragic. So all this was going on in Seattle at the time of World War II. So, and like I said, there was always that danger of um, the idea that the Japanese could invade us or bomb us um, being on the West Coast. It, it was yeah. the same way, I think, on the East Coast for uh, people worried about the Nazis invading uh, too. So there was just always that sort of danger hovering around. So I thought it was a perfect, perfect setting for a serial killing uh, type of espionage. The, bla the yeah. blackouts are just like the everything. That's a recipe for just. Oh, yes. It's so like, creepy. Like, yes. I just thinking about it. I was like, I'm getting anxious now. <laughs> <laughs> so I well, would you not could, do you well. know, They were saying you could go outside your door and look out like if you had a nice view of the city and just not see anything. And so wild. Things. Yeah. Oh. Um. Oh, I had a question now while we were talking about it, and then I, I lost it. Oh. Um, I'll, I'll, I talked too long. I kept, I, oh, no, I wouldn't no, shut up. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no, it's a very, it's such a, no, it's great learning because what I love about historical fiction is, I mean, I love research and everything, but it's such a good way to get these snapshots of history. So I love hearing, like, no, this is a very oh, yeah. great answer. And it's like, it's like through fiction, you get to learn so much because like, I only know a little bit about the internment camps, but so I would definitely need to look into more, but I had, you know, before, no idea about yeah, that. Yeah, well, they, uh, Jamie Ford's um, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet is a wonderful book to read about. I'll have to. Uh, yes, and he's so good. In fact, I, I met him uh, sometime, we had some event together uh, when the book was, you know, still hadn't come out yet. And I was like, Jamie, I just want you to know, I just totally plagiarized the hotel on the corner of Bitter and Sweet. I, I used so much of your, you know, research. And he's like, go ahead. He said, I did, I didn't, I didn't intern anybody. I don't own the hotel. I don't have a copyright on it. So yeah, it's some great books. The David Gooderson, Snow Falling on Cedars is another great book about the internment camps. So. I haven't read that, but I've heard the name of, the, I've heard that yeah. before, but. No, I need to. He's another, he's another Seattle author. He's uh, over on Bainbridge Island. Oh. Um, so one of the things you mentioned in the synopsis, like when we were going over um, your sharing with the readers about the synopsis was Rosie the Riveter, which I always find so up until I probably a little too long, I thought Rosie the Riveter was like, like it was, I didn't realize it was multiple people, like what it meant exactly. Oh, you thought it was one person. I love it. I did for a long time. <laughs> and then I finally started learning. I was like, Oh, there's, I get it now. Um, <laughs> Isn't it funny how you don't, you have, you hear a word or something like that. And it just, you just never, I, okay, here's a confession. You're going to be like, what is wrong with him? Pilates. I thought it was something you got at Starbucks. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it sounds like, the, it's, it's I like can hear I'll it. have a Pilates with uh, <laughs> extra cream. You know, it's like, uh, so, you know, I, I think I, for months I was, I was like, Pilates, that's an exercise? Uh, like, okay. I like, that's my no. favorite thing. <laughs> I can hear it though, it's like a latte. Yeah. Um, so but I found out a lot about Rosie. I bet you that's where you were going with this. Oh about... yes, that's where I was going. <laughs> um, so Rosie the Riveter is an iconic figure in history. I know she is based on um, an, a person, um, but what was your research into like the women who, who were on the, in the factories? What was that like? Well, it was, it was really interesting. I one of the the I, there's a couple of movies that really kind of pushed me over the edge towards really getting fascinated with Rosie the Riveter and World War II. One is called um, uh, "Since He Went Away," since you went away with Claudette Colbert and Jennifer Jones and Shirley Temple, and it's about a mom keeping the home fires burning with her two daughters while her husband and the father is away in the military, and it's just everything that went on during the war, it was made by David O. Selznick, who did Gone with the Wind. And he made it during the war and it's very flag waving patriotic, but it's, it's, she ends up working in, as a riveter in the end, uh, she, she uh, decides that it's her patriotic duty to do so. You know, she wants to do something to help 
Um, and the other movie is Swing Shift with Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. Mm. And um, that was actually, um, they, the movie was a very serious look at, uh, at Rosie the Riveter and the things she went through. And um, they, uh, Rosie, uh, uh, Goldie Hawn's agent, saw some of the rushes and was like this should really be a romantic comedy so they they ended up editing it and um somewhere somewhere there exists like a three-hour version of swing shift that's very serious and it's the director's cut look it up but it's okay. it's supposed to be the essential rosie the riveter movie and as it it ended up being just sort of a romantic comedy set during world war ii with rosie the riveter but um, so I was always sort of fascinated with Rosie the Riveter. And one of the things that um, one of the things that I found out about her is that um, most of the women who took these jobs had been employed before, but lost their jobs during the depression because, you know, women were the first ones to get the ax because it was like, yeah. no, a man should have that job. And um, in fact, my mom uh, was, couldn't get a job because her, her father forbid her. He was like, no, you can't, don't take a job. I'm, I'm supporting you, um, you know. And she, you know, she'd gotten out of school and everything else and was all ready, but it wasn't, it wasn't the right time because of the depression. Uh, the other thing I found out was, was how, how much there was like sort of a sudden integration uh, there because a lot of uh, women of color were suddenly getting jobs, in fact, People, they'd been uh, so many women who were domestics, who were maids and waitresses, suddenly could be bumped up and have a job that paid more. So there was a terrible maid shortage um, because of the Rosie the Riveter, um, because of women suddenly have in the workforce. And um, another thing I found out was that as soon as they, um, the war was winding down, the, and these women were become had become so you know adjusted to their work and everything else they were like you're out of there um you're you know it's time to go back to the kitchens women blah 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 and uh so suddenly suddenly they were back in their their houses after this sort of surge of independence um and i can imagine that'd be such a yes drastic change I and they're supposed to be happy with the way going back to the way things were you know yeah and they had resistance. There were men there who uh, who had the jobs, who had the riveting jobs, who really resented women taking their jobs. It's like, no woman can do my job. It sort of emasculated them. And these, a lot of these men who worked in the factories during the war already felt a slightly emasculated because they weren't fighting. They weren't, you yeah. know. And so they, having women doing their jobs was even extra sort of humiliating. So it, it's... It was just really interesting. The other interesting thing I found out was that the juvenile delinquency rate just skyrocketed during the war because suddenly mom wasn't home. She mm -hmm. was at work and dad was fighting the war. And so all these teenagers who were suddenly left on their own um, were, you know, misbehaving. So yeah. the other weird thing I I have to show you, okay, that I found out, I do, I, I'm such a nerd. This is like, this is one of those things is like, I can't believe he's showing me this, but this is, no, I, this is the Rosie the Riveter we know. Um, mm -hmm. We can do it, woman. And um, she was actually, that really isn't Rosie the Riveter. That um, it was a Westinghouse poster uh, that ran for two weeks during the war in 1943. And then it disappeared. And the actual Rosie the Riveter is from Norman Rockwell's Saturday Evening Post cover. And oh. she looks a little bit like a Michelangelo who's inspired by the Sistine Chapel. And she's got Rosie on her lunchbox. She's standing on a copy of Mein Kampf. And she's got all these badges like about saving, say, about rationing and everything else. And... Um, because of the Norman Rockwell estate, they didn't, the copyright on that picture was not, um, it was very limited and people couldn't use it. So when we got more interested in Rosie the Riveter in like the late seventies, suddenly this emerged out of nowhere. And um, 
became sort of the emblem for Rosie the Riveter. It wasn't even supposed to be women working. It was it was just a general we can do it sort of encouragement to the people at Westinghouse. So there's my there's my nerdy story. And did you know what? I also you know it's like <laughs> Go no, ahead. Do you, tell, do you tell that story at parties, Kevin? That's fascinating. You know, it's like, but I, 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 I found it really fascinating. I was like, that was. I always thought that was Rosie the Riveter, and not. No, that's also. I, I can't remember if I'd heard about, but I remember because everyone, yeah, the, the 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 yellow background one. That's the one yeah. everyone always thinks of. That's what I yeah. always think of. Yeah, yeah that that's, one. Uh, that's she's been identified as Rosie for the longest time, but this Which is, is why the real Rosie. <laughs> it's so crazy how stuff like that happens. Like it's just very, that's also I find that very fascinating. Um, so I'm going to go back to some of our reader questions. Sure. Um, this is more about the writing process, which I'm always very interested. They're kind of, they want to know um, what is your, oh, what does your writing process involve? I think that's, I may be misreading the question, but I may, um, what is your writing process like and what does that include? Um, well, it's like, I think it's, you, you know, it's habit. It, it's mm -hmm. you know, so much how you're, you form the habit and having worked for the railroads for 17 years, I'd gotten into the, um, the habit of writing in the evenings after I got back from work. And it was a, it was a perfect job for somebody who, who really aspire to do something else <laughs> and, and uh, you know writing is so great because it's it's one of those things you don't need to you know be outside doing it you don't have to go mm -hmm. to an office you can actually get it done with just you know a pad of paper and a pencil and uh, you're suddenly a writer and um so i learned to i started writing at night i would work all the live long day for the railroads and i write at night sometimes you know, well, you know, I would be traveling, like I said, and I would be in like someplace like Pasco, Washington, in the Red Lion or the Best Western. And I'd be like, it's either the, a Brady Bunch rerun or go to the bar uh, in the hotel or I can sit down and, you know, write this novel that I'm working on. And so that was a great choice. And this was before the Internet. This was before um, even computers. I was... You know, in fact, my first book was written entirely on a, you know, on an old fashioned typewriter, an electric typewriter. So, that's but nice. um, that's how the habit started. So I would write at night. And um, so I still do most of my writing in the evening, um, you know, like after, like around starting at 11 o'clock and I'll write all, all evening long. Um, I'll take a break and watch a movie or something like that. But I end up finishing my writing around five o'clock in the morning, 530 in the morning. And so that's when I, I find I'm at my peak. Um, as the book, if when I'm working on a book, as the deadline looms, I'm of course writing all day long and all night long, and it feels like it feels like finals week at school. Mm -hmm. and it's like you're just sleep deprived. In fact, I noticed I noticed after a few books that my heroine is always extremely sleep deprived by the end of the book. And that was <laughs> me too. I'd be like totally you know, uh, in just a zombie practically, but you know, that's those, that's sometimes when the creative juices just really flow and you get a lot of great ideas. But if on the technical side of the writing, um, I usually start out with an idea and mm -hmm. sometimes John, my editor will give me an idea. He'll say, what do you think about this? And I'll kind of flesh it out a little bit and then throw it back at him. And, um, he will, we will kind of discuss it for a while. And then I will write an outline, um, usually around 60 pages long. And the outline is, mm -hmm. is like a mini novel. It's not like with bullet points. It's more like, you know, it's a snowy evening and blah, 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 blah. And I'll have dialogue in there and description. And um, I'll submit that to him. And he'll say, you know, okay, that works. And <laughs> <laughs> um, then I go, like, like, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see it like that. Oh, I like this. Okay. That works. And I try and make it as entertaining as possible so that, you know, so that it does work as far as he's concerned. And occasionally he'll say, oh, you know, um, you know, I, I want you to throw something else in there because there's not enough of 
X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, okay, I, I understand that. And so um, he gets, he has a really good idea of where the book is, what it's going to be like when he gets it, uh, which, yeah, is, which is really great. I, I know, <laughs> in fact, I know several authors who have submitted their finished books and the editor is like, this isn't what I was expecting at all. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to have to, you know, in fact, speaking of Jamie Ford, he had written a book after um, Hotel on the Corner of Bittersweet. And the, the publisher wasn't happy with it because it wasn't exactly like the previous book. And he was like, well, of course it's different. And um, uh, he ended up, you know, and I know several other authors, they end up kind of just putting this book that they worked on for a year and a half, two years aside and, uh, you know, kind of taking their losses. So I, I'm really happy with the way I work with my editor. He's great. Yeah, John is great. I was, I was, isn't, he, isn't he great? Yes, he's wonderful. Yeah. And he, like I said, he gives me so many of my ideas. He'll start out with, you know, what do you think about, with this, um, he said, you know, he was very influenced by Alfred Hitchcock's The Shadow, A Shadow of a Doubt, which is a great old movie from 1943, which I, I, I so, oh, have you seen it? I haven't seen that one, but oh. I do love, uh, I love Hitchcock. So oh, yeah. I, oh, you've got to see, that's, that's Hitchcock's favorite. Oh, I haven't. Okay, so I need yes, to watch that one. So I definitely, because I was gonna say there's a few references to Hitchcock in your book, and so I was gonna. Oh, always, always. So. It, you know, it's like it's one of my. He's he's my favorite. So anyway, good, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no. Oh no, no, no. Sorry, I was gonna let you go ahead. Oh, no, but we're both so polite. I was. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Um. Well, that kind of leads me into another reader question, and I was yeah. thinking about this too especially based on our earlier conversation where you were saying about the, what time you're at your kind of not, maybe don't argue with people kind of time period. Yeah. So you're up all night writing, which if I was writing the scary books, I would not, I would be so terrible. I would be scaring myself all the time. Um, so a reader wants to know, have you ever ended up uh, scaring yourself while writing? Oh yeah. I tell this story. I, if anybody's watching repeat, um, me for the second or third time, they're like, oh, he's not going to tell that story again, but I'm going to tell it again, is um, I was writing, in fact, I think it was unspeakable. I had, a, I was sitting right here in this chair in front of my computer, and I, I had come up with a really creepy idea, and, and I just, it kind of creeped me out, and it was about one or two in the morning, and I went up to get, um, I got up to get a dictionary out of a slang dictionary uh, that I had in my bedroom. And um, I go past the front door and it's open. And I was like, what? It's two o'clock in the morning. My door is open. I just freaked out. And I ran into the kitchen and got a meat tenderizer. And, and I was telling this story to somebody and they said, you got Lori's seasoning salt? I was like, no, I got a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I got my seasoning. <laughs> I, I, I got to get that seasoning salt out. Yeah, <laughs> I do that every time I get frightened. Um, no, I got a little hammer and I went around checking every, you know, little nook and cranny in my apartment. And fortunately I was fine, but I, yeah. you know, I put myself into that. I get, keyed up and I get a little frightened too, but in a weird way, it kind of exercises um, the fright and I get it out mm -hmm. of my system. Uh, it's, you know, like they say sometimes about writing things down, it really helps to, yeah. you know, write things down. And I think to write things down and scare other people really helps because like, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm going to share my fear. Here you go. <laughs> <That's yours. laughs> yes. Go. Well, I was, I was, when I was a kid, I was, scared all the time. I was a very frightened child. I used to drive my parents crazy because I would have nightmares all the time and mm -hmm. scream out in the middle of the night. My my dad was out of town one time and I was about six years old and I kept having a nightmare. The same nightmare kept reoccurring while I, I just, was oh. Yeah. And I kept waking up screaming that, that there was a man in the house. And I, I, and I have an older brother and four older sisters, and they were all going crazy. They're like, "There's a man in the house. Where did where did he <laughs> see this man? Like, He's gonna kill us all." <laughs> oh, no, that's terrible. I know. Sorry, that reminds me of one time I was like very young, and I heard 
something outside my window. And I was convinced, I don't know what I was convinced it was, a monster probably. Of course. It turned out to be a very cranky cat. <laughs> and I was convinced Those cats. that he was, I don't know, it was, yeah, it was not happy. You have to be careful with cats and clown pictures, you know, <laughs> like I had, I had clown pictures in my uh, bedroom growing up. There were these two big pictures and the bozo clown really scared the bejesus out of me when I was a kid. I, I there, wish... It's creepy. I'm like, yeah. I don't have a pair of clowns, but I will respect that they are, they can be creepy. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would be terrified if my door was open at 2 a.m. I would be like, yeah, I like I'm usually today. pretty, I'm very, you know, anal retentive about things like that. Oh yeah. I was like, lock all the windows. I was like, making sure everything's closed. Um, so I was going to ask about, um, oh, because I was thinking about earlier and another, and a reader asked this as well about, um, what made you become an author? So you, you know, you said you had your other job and everything. So what, inspired you? Did you always want to be an author? That's a great question. I, um, I loved Hitchcock growing up and, um, I loved getting, I loved scaring myself. And, um, in fact, I, what got me really intrigued with Alfred Hitchcock was my, my oldest sister who she's 15 years older than me. And she always, she was always like sort of the disciplinarian of the family. My my mom kind of like shrugged everything off on my sister Adele and made her made her you know, like she was like the semi babysitter. And I don't think she enjoyed it much. So she was not she was not happy with us younger kids. And she was terrified of taking a shower in the house alone. That you know, somebody else had to be in the house if she was yeah. gonna take a shower. And um and I was like. I was about six or seven. I was like, why is she so scared? And my other sister explained, she was like, well, there's this movie Psycho where a woman yeah, a is like... stabbed in the shower and it's very, very scary. And I was like, oh my gosh, how can I see Psycho? I want to, and I had already been like a Hitchcock fan, you know, watching his TV show. Mm -hmm. And so I was just dying to watch Psycho. And it was supposed to be on, um, TV in 1966. It was supposed to be on the CBS Friday night movie. Cause, and this was back in the day where you didn't have access to movies like you do now. You, you know, you waited for a movie to come on TV and uh, they would probably, you know, have several commercial interruptions and they'd edit the movie any type, type of way they wanted to. And um, it got canceled because right in our town right next to us in Kenilworth, Illinois. I grew up in Glencoe, Illinois. In Kenilworth, our senator's daughter was brutally murdered that uh, like just a few days before Psycho was supposed to be on the air. And so CBS pulled it. They did not show it. And so it was, uh, and they never solved that murder, by the way. It's Valerie Percy. It's an unsolved murder. Um, she was bludgeoned to death in her bedroom um, at, like, at like four o'clock in the morning or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, they, it's, it's a really scary, creepy case, but, um, anyway, they finally did show Psycho around 1969, 1970. And it, I just, I was just enamored with it. And I was just, a psycho. yes, I just thought it was brilliant. And I was so scared watching it. And, um, I was just a psycho buff. And, uh, when I went to college on a lark, I decided to take a creative writing class and I had already shown some interest in creative writing and I kind of enjoyed writing stories. A lot of times they were, they were um, like Hitchcock ripoff stories. And in fact, one of them <laughs> like Hitchcock fan fiction. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. And um, they were, and one of them was actually, um, almost a ripoff of uh, Since You Went Away. It was a woman during the war. Uh, like, uh, and Because I was already fascinated with that whole subject back then. Anyway, um, in college, Anna Lark, I took a creative writing class and the teacher was wonderful. Her name was Ann Powers and she, um, she was an author herself and she would have parties at her house and invite select students to come and read their stories to the, her party guests, some of whom were like agents and editors and things like that. So, and I remember at her house, 
I was telling you this before we started filming, uh, before we started filming, before we did our, we started <laughs> our session here, um, that when I was at her place, I noticed that she had framed book covers of her mm -hmm. of her books and so you can see this is what i've got here too it's like a monument to my own ego but um i just remember thinking at the time you know if i ever publish a book i want to i want to get the book covers framed and put them someplace like in a study or something like that and she was just so great she was uh she put, told us about how to get published not about mm -hmm this is what you have to write. It's not like, oh, you know, let's read Beowulf and and, <laughs> and write something like that. It was, she was like, well, this is how you, you know, you've got to buy, buy the writer's market book. You've got mm -hmm. to, you know, check with an agent. You've got to, you've got to do this, 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 here are the steps to getting published, uh, which was very useful. And I, at one point asked her, I told her, I said, you know, I am not the best writer in this class, but you seem to be so encouraging and so helpful to me and i said you know i i'm so flattered that you are and she said well you remind me of my friend robert block um I, i'm in a writer's that i was in a writer's group with and i was like robert block who wrote psycho and, <laughs> and he is the author of psycho and she worked with him and, and so um i went to college at marquette university in milwaukee and psycho is based on the Ed Gein story that happened in Wisconsin. And Robert oh. Block lived in Wisconsin. That's how they all knew each other. Um, I should say not not Ed Gein, but my uh, my, oh, my, my teacher and Robert Block knew each other. Um, and so I, I think I was just sort of destined after that. I was like, oh, I wanna, I wanna be a writer. And I I remember telling my parents, I, I said, you know, I, I think I wanna be an author. And um, God bless them. They they bought me an electric typewriter and they bought me a big poster of a typewriter too uh, for like Christmas. Aww. So they were very encouraging. They didn't feel, oh, that's a that's a pie in the sky ambition. So that was I set I set my goal. In fact, I I set a goal for myself back in college. I I said, you know, if I don't get published by the time I'm thirty, I'll give up. But I'm going to try and get published either a short story or a book mm -hmm. or something. And I sold my first book on my 30th birthday. My, my agent, yeah, my agent called at like six o'clock in the morning and uh, she's singing happy birthday to me like Marilyn did to JFK and, and mm -hmm. it's like really breathy and everything else. And then she said, for your birthday, I'd like to tell you that your book has been sold. And I had been trying to sell it for a year. And um, she said, and it has, so give me a call. I was like, oh my God. So I thought that's such I, a good I, birthday I, gift. Oh, it was great. When the phone rang, I thought there was a railroad derailment. I was like, oh my God, I've been I've been called about a derailment. <laughs> you know, it's six o'clock in the morning. But no, apparently that she'd already gotten the word nine o'clock in New York that uh, oh, yeah. that publisher wanted the book. So oh, well, that is yeah, that's a great gift. You're like, <gasps> yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't uh, decide to give up a day or two early. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it is tomorrow is Halloween, which I'm very excited about. Yes. Um, and we kind of touched on Hitchcock who very creepy movies, birds terrified me as a child. Yes. Um, do you have any other Halloween movies that are, that you like to watch or any spooky type movies that you always watch around this time of year or just maybe recommend? Oh, but I love talking sure. about movies. Like, oh. Sure. Yeah. In fact, I've got my place. You can see a little pumpkin back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I've got a mobile right there. So like your candles up there. Yes. I love nice it. Candles. I love it. Um, let's see. I watched over the weekend. I watched. It's a tough one to watch because it's long, but it's so creepy and very well done is Zodiac. Which is Oh, I think I watched that. <laughs> I, know. I, I could see from your expression. You're like, uh, that's kind of sure that is but... not. It's not fun, creepy. It is creepy, creepy, and it's That's just. Fun. I was like, I get roped into watching. I watched a lot of creepy movies growing up, and then I got older, and something happened. My brain was like, no. So I got roped into watching that. If it's is it the one Mark Ruffalo? Yes. No. Yes. Is okay. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I did watch that, and I was like, mm, no, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's very, it's very tough to take. I for I forgot how. Um, 
brutal it is at the beginning mm -hmm. because it it shows the main murders and it's like one after another practically and then the rest of the movie is them trying to solve you know trying to find zodiac um but that's a that's a you know i just watched cat people which is an old creepy old movie um oh, yeah. that's if you've got turner movie classics you can they show cat practically every month and it's it's a fun old movie um of course, I love Psycho. I just rewatched that last week for the like, oh, must have been at least the 50th time. And it's still, for me, it never grows old. The Exorcist was a movie that really scared the hell out of me when I was a teenager. I stood in line to watch that um, at, when it premiered in, didn't premiere in Chicago, but when it's opening week. And it was in January of 1973, I think. And I just remember being freezing cold and waiting out for an hour and a half to see this movie. It was, and it being worth it. I couldn't fall asleep that night to save my life. I, but that was, that was really creepy. I might watch King Kong tonight, just the old, old oh. King Kong, just to see something good. Good old Halloween is a good scary one too. Mm -hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, uh, there's, I, it's just, it's endless. Right now, Turner Movie Classics is showing a bunch of old, old creepy and, uh, movies. So I have, I think, H they ha have HBO, and I think Turner Classic yes, does. HBO something Max. Like, so I may have to. Yeah. I need to catch up. I've been behind on my Halloween movie watching for some reason. I know. I just suddenly. I, I, yeah, it just sort of creeped up on us. No pun intended. Know, like you're saying, yeah, it really happened. I was like, because I always watch Practical Magic, and I always watch oh. Pocus, and like some of like the more less scary classics but yeah and then well, I those are watch. fun those are fun you know it's yeah, easier ones great pumpkin, charlie brown i mean it's there's there's a lot of fun movies that are kind of well like young frankenstein is perfect oh love young Halloween. frankenstein you can, you can have some laughs and everything else i i you do you love how you asked about you know halloween movies and i'm like right away go to this dark <laughs> place with the zodiac it's like no, no fun pumpkins and everything else let's go right to a serial killing thriller i mean it's um, on theme with the book <laughs> let's cut yeah. to the chase none of this fun stuff but yeah like, no i do love i'm like time. i love creepy movies and i want to watch them but i also know like i was I think i was telling you it was like i can read creepy books don't bother me something movies my brain is just like once i see it visually well, i can't it's the visual it. part i think it's the mm -hmm. you can't get the you know i think you can create the old, old the image in your head really well um yeah. and you can buffer it you can you can kind of screen it's, it I really then, tone this down. yeah so you you have more control over the situation yeah i was like i remember watching signs i was like i did not sleep well after that movie. no oh god no that i just i just remember that being um that one moment in signs that everybody was like, i think what? i know it's the cornfield one of course yes yep and i've that, never done so hard it's <laughs> one of those <laughs> movies i the first time i watched it i thought it was pretty good and then afterwards i didn't like it at all i was like these two guys work this farm that's like 10 football fields big and you never see them actually working the farm that's <laughs> true it's like i haven't watched that in a while but i also aliens creep me out so that's that's my oh alien and, and aliens it, that's yeah talk about aliens. It, I haven't watched that one alien while, and probably. aliens is, is like intense um and so kind of going into the Halloween conversation a little bit more, um, do you have any Halloween traditions that you like to do? Like maybe watching, rewatching movies or anything else? Um, not really. I'm not, I'm not that huge a Halloween person. I mean, I, I think as you get older and that's, you know, now that it, it's like, okay, I'll put the, I'll put decorations up a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, it's not, it's not quite like Christmas for me. So and I live in an apartment, so I very rarely have Get any the trick or treaters. Trick or treaters. So it's usually I'm pretty boring on Halloween. It's usually like you said, I I will try and find a movie that's fun to watch. Like like you said, like like Young Frankenstein or Arsenic and Old Lace. Some something that's kind of fun and kind of it's spooky scary season. At the same time, yeah, yeah, it's very no, good fun. I'm so you're more of a Christmas person? Is that your favorite? Yeah, that's my favorite <laughs> holiday. That's without a doubt, without a doubt. 
It is a good one. I love the Christmas lights. It's hard to go wrong in the season. Oh, nothing looks. Oh, yes. The Christmas lights are up. It's like magic. Oh, I know. And it, it, you know, the. I'm just. I'm going through this whole thing right now. Do you, do you have time? Do, do you have time oh, for me? Yeah, we have time for me, for me to psychoanalyze me because I, <laughs> as I'm getting older, I'm just like losing the passion for so many things. So it's like I find myself in the last few Christmases like putting up the tree, going, "This is agony. Why am I doing this? This is horrible." <laughs> they are frustrating. This. I hate <laughs> this. You know, it's like, and you know, I I have these flashbacks to when I was a kid, like putting the ornaments up on the tree and being so excited and everything else. And I, I'm like, "Oh, damn it to hell! I got oh, this ornament doesn't fit here. This looks stupid." Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's me. <laughs> I know. I know. I get so I critical that, of yeah. my work, and you know, at once it's up, it's great. But it's like, I, you know. I kind of go through this whole thing now. It's like, oh, oh God, I have to drag that fake tree from up from downstairs in the basement up to here. I, I I have hernia issues. I can't do this, you know. And it's once everything's up, I'm so happy. But then yes. January ish rolls around. I'm like, now I have to take it down. <laughs> and take it down. Like, and suddenly you realize how dim and depressing your place is. <laughs> um yeah, no, it's like I had a wreath that goes up on my house and has Christmas lights in it. My fiance was like, I was like, okay, I took it down. He's like, what do you mean? Now it's not all bright and pretty in here anymore. When we like watch movies, and I was like, so I put up some lights to have up. Cause I was like, it does look a little sad without all of the. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, I, I always feel like I have to repaint my place after I've taken down my Christmas decorations. Yeah. Like, Oh, it's a little grimy without, you know, without all that light distracting you. Yeah. It's like, oh. all right. Something about, sorry. I was like, I could talk about Christmas too. <laughs> it's like, I love it. Um, but I want to get back to some, sorry. I realized I need to get back to some of the reader questions. Yes. I'm um, seeing a bunch here. I know there's quite a few and we will, I'll send some of these to you that maybe we didn't get to and we can, oh, do okay, something. sure. We can do something with them. Um, oh, Oh, they want to know, did you see the new Exorcist movie? I know that's not book related. No, but I haven't yet. No, I just read up on it that they said it was pretty good. And then they got Ellen Burstyn to do it too, which is, yeah, that's great that they got the original star. Yeah, so like, yeah, oh, I, I have not seen it yet. Watch. So. In fact, I may I may give The Exorcist a shot tonight. I don't know what I'm going to watch tonight. But there I, you go. Just I mean, like, yeah. which mood? I don't, uh, know, I don't know if you've seen... Um, there is talk about creepy. Oh my God. There is a scene that was cut from the original Exorcist where Linda Blair um, walk, she creeps down some stairs backwards. Oh. She, oh, and, think... she's like, and they call it the spider walk scene. And mm -hmm. it's the creepiest thing you've ever seen. And it's, it's, they did incorporate it in a director's cut. But it was when I first saw it, I just, the hair stood on, you know, my head. I was like, Oh my God! They they got some contortionist to do this walk backwards yeah. on all oh, yeah, fours like, down, a, down a staircase, and um, it's just very creepy just to see this kid doing this. So check it out. I think you can probably Google it. Just spider walk. You may not be able to because yeah. I may not sleep. <laughs> you want to creep okay. yourself out? Go for it. Yeah, I was like, if you're ready to do that, then all our readers are ready to do that. I, yeah, well, that makes me think of the grudge. I think it's in the grudge that it's either the grudge or the ring, or something like that happens. And I was like, I think it's, oh, I think it's the ring. I think it's when she gets out of the TV. And I was like, nobody should be able to do that. Yes. My, I, one of my friends from the Seattle Seven Writers is wrote the grudge. Oh, so, wow. Oh, that's Steven very important. Sarko, he did that the American version. Out. Yeah. So. They did a great job. That terrified yeah, me. Yeah, he's a great guy too. Um, and this is something I'm always interested in too. Is like, which of your books would you like to see made into a movie? Um, do you ever think when you're writing, does that do you ever visualize as if it is oh, a movie? God, yes. I'm. I think very cinematically when I'm writing. I, I, you know, I want the reader to sort of see everything, and uh, you know. I, I like having a lot of dialogue and uh, to move the story forward. In fact, I started out writing screenplays, thinking cool. I was going to be a screenwriter and um, or wanting to be a screenwriter. And mm -hmm. I ended up doing novels, which is so much better um, because you you got so much 
uh, more freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. But but it does teach you how to move the story forward through dialogue and action rather than a lot of description and stuff like that. But um, yeah, and I just totally lost track of the question because I'm spacing oh. out. Oh, no, you're good. Sorry. Uh, any of the books would you like to see? Or Yes. Books? Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> Hello. I have another cup of coffee, Kevin. Um, no, you're good. I think, well, one of them was supposed to be a movie. With My first book with Kensington was Only Son. And about a, a man who, um, he's a nice guy, and he kind of snaps at one point. He thinks this... Um, this couple are going to be terrible parents and they have a baby and he abducts the baby and moves from Portland to Seattle and raises the child as his own. And um, he sends little like postcards to the mother to let her know that the child is okay. And that like he said his first words and blah, 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 blah. And so the mom is never giving up on the fact that her kid is out there somewhere and and yet she's sort of reassured at the same time that he's out he's okay but mm -hmm. um and it's really it's the mom's story and the guy's story and the kid's story when he's 12 years old he starts to figure out something's wrong here with my, with yeah. my dad and it was called only son it was a hard sell and my agent sent it out we couldn't sell it to save our lives and we were trying for a year and a half. And finally, she started sending it to movie people. And um, she sent it to David Seltzer, who wrote The Omen. And mm -hmm. um, he said, I really like this. I'm going to send it to a leading man I have in mind. And I can't tell you who it is, but I will let you know what he thinks. So you know, I was telling all my friends this. And they were like, oh, OK. I'd get a call from a friend, and they'd be like, Kevin, this is Eric Estrada. I'm reading your book right now. I think it's terrific. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so they were going to finally, apparently the leading man liked it, and they were going to have a big meeting at MGM. And um, when they were having the meeting, I was out in the railroad yards in the rain, like thinking, right now in Hollywood, they're having a big meeting <laughs> on my book, and I'm looking at freight cars and, and in this with my hard hat on in, in the in the railroad yards. And um, I got back and my agent was I had left a message and said, call me. And so I called her and she said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. And she said, they want to go with it. They want to buy only son. And the leading man is Tom Hanks. And this was <gasps> this was right after he did Philadelphia. So he was. Oh, really yeah. Big. Mm -hmm. um, not like, he, like he's not big now, but he, <laughs> was, he was like, he was big hot. And he was like right before Forrest Gump, I think was made, but it hadn't come out yet. And um, so it was supposed to be Tom Hanks and Holly Hunter and um, Dave, uh, John Peelmeyer, who wrote the um, Agnes of God, which is a great movie with Jane Fonda and Anne Bancroft. Um, he did the screenplay. And uh, so I was just, on cloud nine for the longest time. And because this movie was in the works, um, Kensington was like, yes, we'll take, we'll take only son and we'll publish it. And they did a wonderful job with the cover. I think I just loved how they, how they did this. And this is back in 1996. And so we did have a movie deal for a while, but unfortunately it just kind of, it was one of those things. It was all set to go. And then, um, they they had some sort of issue with the screenplay and then uh tom hanks decided to drop out and do that thing that you do i don't know if you ever oh, saw that but he decided i've heard of it but i don't think i've ever seen it yeah it was it it did okay so he did he did all right but um <laughs> that was the closest to a movie deal i've had um and i still got to keep the money and um which was nice and i bought my place with with the uh, down payment that i got so um, it turned out to be great. If there's a, I would not mind seeing that only some become a movie. And yeah. that's a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> that is a very but, interesting answer. Tom Hanks. But I'd also, movie. of course, I would love to see the enemy at home become a thriller. Um, I'd love to see it become like a mini series on Netflix or Amazon prime or something like that. That'd be, be a good mini series. Yeah. I think it'd be a great mini series. Cause there's a, a lot of, 
characters in there and you could, mm -hmm. I mean, it's good for, I think at least three episodes, um, you know, so I, and I think it's, it would be, it'd be fun to have something set at that time period too. And see, yeah. actually see it. And you don't, there are it's very limited amount of home front. Uh, I was just thinking that stories. Um, and most of them, it feels like they are more set in Europe. And oh, they're like, almost all set it. in Europe. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I think I, I find it very fascinating. I wrote, I wrote the enemy at home during the pandemic and it was so mm -hmm. interesting to see the parallels between how people were reacting to the restrictions that they had mm -hmm. during the pandemic to the restrictions they had during world war II and the rationing mm -hmm. and, you know, the way of the, how Americans were asked to sacrifice back then, yeah. you know, and the contrast and, and, yeah. and often the similarities. So no, that's a great, that's, a, yeah, that's what I, that's what I liked about it. It's just like, cause like, like you're saying, I have not read very many that are set on the home front. But. Yeah. Well, and that's what a lot of the reviewers were saying too. They were like, well, it's, you know, this is a unique setting so, compared to all the other, because World War II, I think is pretty popular right now, you know? So. Yeah. It's like, there's so many stories. Like every time I pick up, I read a World War II, I'm like, I learn so much more than I, yes. it's, it's just, there's so, there's so much to know or so much to learn. Yes. It's, and you're like, it's just so many different stories. Yeah, it's like, I think the one I, all the light, yeah. The one that they're doing. Oh, all the light we movie. cannot see that's going to be mm -hmm. on, um, we're doing a commercial for is it netflix i, I know we really are doing it. <laughs> we're doing a commercial. that's next week i'm i'm gonna tune in i i it's been so popular yeah it's like Novel. that was something there was stuff in that i learned about so oh, i know and it's the the challenge as a writer to put something during that period is so often during that period they didn't know what was going on at the time mm -hmm. and we do now so for the example, hindsight uh, yeah yeah, when I did the enemy at home, I was going to make reference to the Bataan Death March that went on that happened in 1942, but it didn't come out until um, and this was the fall of Bataan during in, in 1942 and during the spring, and the Japanese forced I think it was thousands and thousands, like seventy thousand. I could oh. be wrong. It might be twenty thousand. It was thousands and thousands of men were forced to march for miles and miles. I mean, we're talking like 60, 60 to 100 miles. I I could look it up <laughs> to get the, I, I wish I had the exact figure how many, but several people died. It was very brutal. And it was one of those, those uh, sort of dark moments in the war that people remembered and referred to. And, um, but they didn't know it was going on until that it happened until 1944. So there were different, even like the death camps in in Europe, we didn't really know about them until until late in the war, very late in the war. You know, so there couldn't be any kind of mention of you know of the concentration camps beyond our limited knowledge that we had of them. So. All right, so I have one. We have so many. I know I should have got two more. We had so many good questions from our readers. I have I'm one more. I've seen some great ones. I know. I was like, oh, I need to. Um, I had so much fun talking with you. I was like, oh, I should probably read some of the questions. Um, so this one kind of ties into a question I have. So one of the readers would like to know, and this will be I'll, this may be our last question, but they would like to know: Will you continue writing historicals? And that leads me into, can you share with us what you're working on next? Yes. I know, I know sometimes you're, sometimes they're not allowed to, so I just want to check. No, no, you can go, we can go ahead and talk it up. Okay. I was, um, after doing the research and, and everything for the, the enemy at home, I, I really enjoyed that and wanted to do another historical. And I was thinking of something set in the 1960s, like, um, like around the Kennedy assassination time. Um, but I, and talking to my editor, he was like, you know, I think World War II, I'd love to see you do another World War II book. And then he had this great idea. He said, you know, what if you took like the Americans, the plot for the Americans? And he said, you know, kind of where people are, are Russian spies living amongst these totally 
clueless other <laughs> neighbors and have them actually be Nazi spies living in like in a neighborhood in Seattle. And I was like, not a bad idea. So especially they rounded up most of the Nazi spies at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. but I don't think they would have. Um, it's so fun when when somebody gives you an idea like this and then I go and do the research uh, <laughs> and then you can kind of find a way to work with it. And um, one of the things is, you know, you weren't going to find most of the Nazi spies were on the East Coast and maybe in the Midwest, but not on the Pacific. Um, but that would be a perfect place for them to be to evade, you know, evade capture. Or, or mm -hmm. so, so I'm having a ball doing that. I, I've been researching Nazis during Nazi spies during World War II, uh, the German American Bund that started up before World War II, and um, so there, I'm just I've started the book. So that's what it's about. It's about a kid who. Um, lives across the courtyard from in an apartment complex from this couple, and he starts to suspect weird things are going on there. And okay. since he's good. a kid who's really fascinated with all the radio shows that have Nazi spies and villains, no one pays attention to him. And he's no, like, really, like, yeah, yeah. So he's the boy who cried wolf, sort of. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, I'm having a ball with that. So that's the, that's the plot. And we don't have a title for it yet, okay. but it should be out, I'm hoping, in 2025. Nice. All right. Well, that is a perfect, I think, ending. I've had, I have some, I have more questions. I know readers have more questions, so I could get, probably get We can do a follow-up. We can do a sequel. Yes, yeah, we'll do a part two. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Um, thank you to the readers for all of your questions. They are amazing. We'll go through and answer them and I, we can pull some and send them over to you, Kevin. Um, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. And all right. Well, happy, I guess, the rest of your evening and happy Halloween to our readers. Thank and, you. Yeah. All right. Well, I will see you all later. And so have a happy good night. Halloween and thank you so much, everybody, for checking in. I see. I love all these questions. These are great. I know some <laughs> really good ones. All right. <laughs> they always have such good questions. So. All right. Well, night. Good night, everybody. Take care. Thank you.